Hello, welcome to chapter five, auditors and liability. Okay, what's the big picture we're gonna talk about here? Well, this is a topic which is only really examinable in P7. It is a little surprising therefore, questions have not appeared more frequently than they have. In practice, and how often have we heard the examiners say that P7 accountants need to demonstrate commercial awareness? He's very, very, the examiner is very much into practical commercial aspects of the P7 paper. Professional firms are certainly very much concerned with their potential liability and as you can see with the current economic crisis how many firms are faced with issues of clients going into administration or liquidation and they are left with the fingers pointing at them as to what on earth were their accounts doing when they were signing them off only a year later. And I've noticed that the audit report has changed in the sense that there's a bit more about going concern within the financial statements. At the end of the day, this is an auditing and not a law exam, but you do perhaps need to be aware of the main principles by which a judgment would be arrived at, and also of any key facts and outcomes of some of the leading cases, such as the Capara case. Our concern is principally with the possibility of civil actions being brought against auditors for the tort of negligence. In other words, they have made a mistake and they are being sued for their, getting their report wrong, or what appear to have got their report wrong. Courts will assess the question of neg negligence in terms of recognised best practice. So in other words, when conducting an audit, if it goes horribly wrong, did you do the best practice? The famous case is Enron, 2001. Arthur Anderson at the time were the auditors and Enron committed lots of fraud, counting irregularities, etc. A lot of shareholders took Arthur, uh, Ernst, sorry, took Arthur Anderson to court and in 2005 Arthur Anderson were actually cleared because they had followed best auditing accounting practice of the time. Things have changed since then but that was not Arthur Anderson's problem. So when looking at a scenario system, you need to look at what's been done, what is the, the significance of the firm who are doing the audit. Significant marks could be available in testing your knowledge and understanding of IFRS. So did the auditors, were they justified in accepting, not accepting a particular accounting treatment? So you do need to understand that. And the international standard on auditing did they or did they not carry out the audit procedures in accordance with best practice based on the circumstances within which the scenario is set? Particular attention should be paid to the determination of whether or not there is a legally enforceable duty of care in the case of a third party as opposed to a client action. So could a third party legally have been relying on what the auditors were saying? And there is a particular case, the BDO Partners case, which talks about that. Although you're taking the international variant of P7, don't forget, really, we are considering UK law as part of our studies in this area. Client action, just mentioned there. What is that? Well, if a client company is to bring a successful action against its auditor, and be awarded anything other than purely nominal damages, they will have to satisfy the court on all three of the following. That there was a duty of care owed, the auditors were negligent, and a connected loss. A legally enforceable duty of care can be established in one of three ways. There was a contract between the parties, there's legal statute, in the country or it's under common law in that you're expected to act with due skill and care as a competent auditor that's the basic sort of level how do you do negligence well you as assess their work against a benchmark i.e professional standards connected loss well, what does that mean it means that there must be some clear connection between the loss incurred by the client and the negligence on the part of the auditor. So there must be a relationship somehow. Third party actions, 
Well, for a third party action to be successful, they will need for the claimant to satisfy the court of the same three issues. In a third party action, negligence and consent loss will be assessed in the same way. However, the contentious area has always been recognising a legally enforceable duty of care, where there is no direct contractual or fiduciary relationship between the auditor and the third party. Now, the current position seems to be that in considering a recognition of potential liability and whether or not the courts will recognise a duty of care, it will take into account the following two criteria. Was their knowledge of the third party's interest and potential reliance upon the work of the auditor? Did the auditor know of the third party's knowledge of, of, of their interest? Also, the proximity of the relationship between the two, whether it was in fact reasonable in the circumstances for the third party to place reliance upon the auditor's work when dealing with the auditor. This is what the Capara case was about, where the judge held that auditors did not owe a duty of care to individual shareholders, although he did intimate that a joint action brought collectively might have been successful. So in the Capara case there was a huge sigh of relief by the auditing profession. OK, turn to chapter 6 now, Ethics. Ethics is at the heart of the ACC examination syllabus and has featured to a lesser or greater extent in over half the papers. It is unlikely that you will have to deal with any of the ethical theories that was a, th a feature of P1, but pre professional ethics studying F8 and P1 must be seen as highly examinable. In the past, an exam question requirement has frequently been along the lines of asking you in relation to, give us an, given a scenario, what ethical quality control and other issues are involved. While it's not necessarily appearing as a question every time in the real exam, it must be seen as a key area for your studies. It's important to appreciate that ACCA have adopted a principles-based approach. This is as opposed to a rules-based approach to ethics. So while there are specific recommendations, you are, if you are faced with a practical question, whether you are not where you are not aware of any specific guidance have been issued, you must always go back to basics and apply the fundamental principles being a principle-based approach, which is sort of almost the, um, based on the circumstances, what's the most common sense approach. Of particular importance to the auditor are the provisions relating to auditor independence. Fundamental principles of professional ethics as outlined in the IFAC Code of Ethics is the mnemonic TOPIC. TOPIC is a good one to remember. What does it stand for? Well, technical, professional competence and due care, objectivity, professional behaviour, integrity and confidentiality. All these traits is what an accountant must have to be professional. So when you're thinking about ethics and behaviour, topic hopefully will come to mind going forward. Threats to ethical behaviour, i.e. what stops you from, be from being those five things we just talked to, looked at? Well, the five threats are self-interest, self-review, familiarity, intimidation and adequacy. Something you really do need to learn by heart will be come up in a scenario or in some, some, some form or shape. So self-interest, you mustn't own shares in a client company, self-review. If you provide accounting services to an audit client, then how can you audit what you've already prepared for them? Familiarity, that's like becoming a, a, an audit partner for 20 years. It's too long. Intimidation, perhaps you're allowing fees to be unpaid for too long and the client saying, well, I'll pay the fee if you take this approach. Advocacy is where you act on a client's behalf in, say, negotiating their finance for the company. But then what happens when you come to audit that client? So what a professional firm of accountants must try and do is safeguard against these threats. It's all part of your quality control procedures as a professional firm. 
what you must try and do uh, also additionally is as created by the ACCA how about requirement potential members to complete an ethics module and those created by members themselves i.e. ensuring that CPD requirements are met these are all good forms of safeguarding against the threats against independence which is crucial. Mm -hmm.